<laughs> Good evening, guys. Got a question as we get started tonight. I got to ask uh, I got to ask a couple guys this question before we even got started. You know, I was thinking about opportunities for growth is the title of tonight's message. And I began to think, you know, uh, what do you do? All of you may have been in this situation. Well, maybe you haven't been in this situation. I've been in this situation. What do you do when you walk into some place and somebody is getting in trouble? Somebody is getting in trouble. Maybe they're getting uh, chewed out by somebody. Maybe they're getting in a little trouble. I asked, I asked Josh was here. He was playing the piano. I asked him this, I asked him this evening. I said, Josh, what, what do you do when somebody, what would you do? If you went into work, Josh, and there's Joe and Daniel, and Joe is just, he's getting into Daniel, he's laying into Daniel, what would you do? And Josh said, I would run right in there, get right in between them, and I figured this thing out. I said, well, but what if, what, if, uh, what if Daniel deserved it? What's going on? What would you do? I think it's so interesting because so many different responses on what we would do when somebody else is getting in trouble. Sometimes you walk in and you just, you, you know, do, you, do I leave? Do I stay? Uh, do I just pretend like I'm not here? Do I just kind of turn around and not look at what's going on over there? What's, you know, what do I do? Uh, I'll just pretend like I'm not listening. Or maybe you, you take a little sweet satisfaction because you say, well, that guy or that girl, they deserve to get in trouble. None of you guys have ever thought that when someone else is getting in trouble. They deserved it. Good for them. They're getting in trouble. And then maybe you pat yourself on the back and you say, well, I would not do what that person did. I would not do that. So, you know, I'm much better than them. And then I, I began to think, I, and I thought, well, what happens when you get in trouble? What happens when you're the one getting in trouble? What do you do when you're the one that's getting in trouble, that's getting somebody's right there in your face? And I began to think there was a time when I was growing up, and, and I had three sisters. So you can imagine with four of us in the house, and then on top of the animals that were in our house, there was all these names. And so my youngest sister, Rachel, was getting in trouble from my dad. And my dad was sitting there, and he was telling Rachel, oh, Rachel, you, you did this thing and that thing and this other thing. And Rachel's just sitting there, and she's like this. <laughs> And my dad's, because she's smiling and she's almost giggling at my dad. Have you any of you parents, you know, when your, your, your son or daughter is in trouble and you're, you're like, you're laying down the law and they're smiling and giggling at you as you're laying down the law. What happens? You probably just get more and more frustrated. And that was happening to my dad. You can see the steam coming out of his ears. He's sitting there berating, berating Rachel. And, and then finally he says, do you have anything to say for yourself, young lady? And Rachel looks straight at my dad, and she says, sure, dad, all those things that you just told me, I'll make sure to tell Mickey when I see her next. Bye. And she walked her off, because my dad had been calling her Mickey the whole time. Oh, she's not Mickey, she's Rachel. My dad was so frustrated, he just walked off, like, oh my goodness. We were called all kinds of names growing up in our house. When I was at Costco, we had manager training. They had Costco University manager training at Costco University. And you went over a period of weeks, you would go to training to learn how to be a manager. And one of the, one of the little workshops that they had, you're sitting around in that circle, one of the workshops that they had is, you know, the different general managers of the stores would come and do your training. So one day, the manager, he just gets right in your face, and he just starts yelling at you. Be like, you did, you wanted to do look at this, look at this mess, and you and all this stuff, and he's right there in my face, and I'm thinking, what in the world is going on? I just walked into this place. I didn't do any of these things. He stopped, and he looked at the entire class, and he says, it didn't matter. You know, I was berating Eli in front of all of you. It didn't matter what I was berating him about. If you're gonna be a manager in Costco, you're gonna make a mistake. And the head manager, me, the head manager, I'm gonna get in your face because you've made a mistake. And I wanna see if you're able to learn when I get in your face. I wanna see if you're able to take what I'm telling you and grow. Because you're gonna make the mistake, but it's not about making the mistake, it's what you do after the mistake that really matters. That's what really matters. I mean, guys, here's the thing, how are you gonna respond? to the challenges of life? How do you respond when somebody gets in your face? How do you respond when things aren't going well? How do you respond when there's a difficult circumstance or a difficult other? We have a hard time in those situations. We, <laughs> we wanna throw ourselves little pity parties. But guys, we're all gonna fall short. 
at different times. And it's in those times where we fall short that there's the greatest opportunity for growth. That's the greatest opportunity for growth is when we're going through difficult situations. And so when, the, when these difficult times happen to you, and maybe they've already happened to you, or maybe you're in a difficult situation right now, or maybe you got somebody in your life that's there, and man, they're just a difficult person. The only question becomes is how do you respond? How do you respond to that other? How do you respond to that circumstance? How do you respond when you feel like you're getting in trouble? Will you use it as an opportunity for growth or will you use it as a pity party for yourself? This is what's going on in our, where we're at in Luke. Jesus has been rebuking the Pharisees. He's been right in their face. They're in trouble, so to speak, and for good reason. But tonight, something different is gonna happen. Jesus turns from these Pharisees. After rebuking these Pharisees, the disciples are standing all around him. And those disciples were those flies on the wall. Maybe it was an awkward moment. Or maybe they were secretly cheering inside saying, you tell those Pharisees, Jesus, how terrible they actually are. They could have been cheering. But tonight, Jesus is going to turn back to his disciples and he's going to use this time as a teaching moment for his disciples. Why? Because he wants his disciples to grow. He, want, he knows that challenges are going to come. He wants his disciples to grow. There's an opportunity here in this moment with the Pharisees for his disciples. This time with the Pharisees wasn't just for the Pharisees. It was for the disciples. And so turn with me in your Bibles to Luke chapter 17. Right there in verse 1, I'm reading out of the ESV this evening. Father God, we commit this time to you. Lord, would you speak to us through your word as you spoke to your disciples 2,000 years ago, God. Would your word be alive tonight and speak to us? Lord, as your disciples, would we have ears to hear what you would say? Lord, we don't wanna, we don't wanna stay the same being in your presence. We wanna be changed as Jim encouraged us in the worship. Lord, change us tonight. Speak a word in season just for me this evening so that you would change me from the inside out. And so God, go before us tonight. We commit this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. And Jesus said to his disciples, temptations to sin are sure to come. After rebuking the Pharisees, the religious leaders, for the sin that was going on in their lives, Jesus turns to his disciples and says, guys, you too are going to be tempted to sin. Temptations to sin are going to come upon you guys just as much as it comes upon the Pharisees. And guess what? Disciples, you too will fall into sin. Why does Jesus say this? Well, because this is what the word of God says. Psalm chapter 53, verse 3, it says this. They have all fallen away together. They have become corrupt. There is none who does good, not even one. We are all sinners. Paul takes that quote there from the Psalms and he uses it in Romans chapter 3, verse 10. Paul says, as it is written, no one is righteous. No, not one. There's not a single person here on this planet who is without sin. Jesus understands that all of us have bro are sinners. We've broken his law. We are lawbreakers. Not a one of us is able to keep the law of God. And why do we break the law? Because in our hearts and our flesh, we're born lawbreakers. That's who we are. And Jesus tells his disciples, because you're in the flesh, as long as you remain on this planet, there will be temptations that come upon you. Don't be surprised at the temptations. They will come upon you as long as you're in the flesh. And the temptations are there to get you to do one thing, to break God's law. And there will be times where you give in to those temptations. You're going to be just like the Pharisees. This is what Jesus is telling these disciples. These Pharisees are breaking God's law. But guys, disciples, you will break God's law just as well as they have broken God's law. And yet, you're not to be like the Pharisees. We cannot be like the Pharisees to continue in sin. If we believe in Jesus Christ, we have to be ones that repent. We have to confess and repent and say, Lord, forgive me, turning from my sin, turn from sin and following the Lord. And the Lord changes us. This is what Isaiah says to Judah. When Isaiah is prophesying, he says, confess and repent your sin, turn to the Lord and there will be a change. Isaiah chapter 1 verses 16 through 18 says, wash yourselves, make yourselves clean, remove the evil of your deeds from before my eyes, cease to do evil, learn to do good, seek justice, correct oppression, bring justice to the fatherless, plead the widow's cause, come now, let us reason together, says the Lord, 
Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. Right here, God is saying, when you become aware of your sin, you need to acknowledge Eli is a sinful man. I've sinned, Lord. I've broken your, I'm a lawbreaker. And as I acknowledge my sin, I'm to repent. I'm to confess and to repent. And repentance means a radical turn, that I'm washing myself, I'm making my, I'm, I'm repenting, I'm saying, Lord, I no longer want to go in that direction. Would you allow me and change me and allow me to walk the way that you would have me walk? Would you change me, Father? And as I confess and as I repent, God forgives. And it's just, it's beautiful. Let's reason together. There's forgiveness to be had in Jesus Christ. And this is a miracle. Forgiveness is an absolute miracle. My sins, your sins, the sins of the world can be forgiven because what Jesus did on the cross, that our sins can be forgiven because Jesus paid the price. He paid the price for you. He paid the price for me. He paid the price for the world. He took punishment, my punishment, your punishment upon himself. It's my favorite verse in the Bible. Jim said, Romans 5 8, but God, my two favorite words. We could do nothing, but God demonstrates his own love towards us in this, that while we were yet sinners, Christ dies for us. But God did a work, nothing but good news at the cross. When we confess and repent, when any man, any woman would confess and repent, God forgives. This is the, the, the good news, the gospel. And yet there's a warning that Jesus is going to give his disciples here. Why? Because many times when we sin, we, we begin to think that my sin only affects who? Me. I live in, uh, I, I, went to, I went back when I was growing up, there was, there was a boy, I forget what disease he was born with, one of the doctors could probably tell me, but he had to live in a bubble. Do you guys remember that? Growing up, there was that, that young boy that had to live in the bubble because he had a, like an immune deficiency and if he, if he went out, and he would get sick and die. And because of this boy, I mean, nobody has to live in that bubble like that little kid anymore. I mean, there's all this research that happened because of this disease that he had. He lived in this bubble. I think he lived, um, I want to say 12 years. I'm sure one of the docs would correct me, but Adele doesn't remember. But I think he lived about 12 years before he passed, living in a bubble his whole life. One of his greatest desires was, was to go out and say, I want to see, I want to see the sky at night. I've seen pictures, but I want to see it with my own eyes. And so NASA built him a space suit that took him 20 minutes to get into it so he could go out and see the night sky. I mean, but that's what we think. We think, my sin, I'm in this little bubble, I'm in a little space suit, and my sin is only affecting me, and it doesn't affect anything outside of this bubble. It's, my sin only affects me. Well, Jesus is going to remind his disciples, and you say, wait a minute. Did the sin of the Pharisees only affect them? Did the sin, well, you just heard what happened with the rich man and Lazarus. Did the sin of the Pharisees only affect them? The answer is no. Why? Because the rich man followed the teaching of the Pharisees, the sin of the Pharisees. And where did he end up? He ended up in Hades. In torment. He, he refused to follow the word of God. He followed the Pharisees. And so he ends up in Hades. Our sin doesn't just affect us. Jesus gives his warning, a warning to the disciples. He says, watch out. What does he say? But woe to the one through whom, through whom they come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were cast into the sea than that he should cause one of these little ones to sin. The word there is woe, watch out. This is serious business, watch out. Jesus is, and this is Jesus telling his disciples, he's no longer talking to the Pharisees, he's talking directly to the disciples and he's saying, you disciples, you the ones that are following me, watch out that when you sin, because you will sin, you do not cause anyone else to sin. You don't cause your brother, you don't cause your sister to stumble when you sin. It would be better for you to get a cement necklace and go swimming in the deepest part of the ocean than for you to, to in your sin, to cause somebody else to stumble. If that's what it would be better for to get a cement necklace going on. Those things, they weigh like a ton. The millstones. Our responsibility. Jesus is reminding the disciples your responsibility is to be an ambassador of Christ, pointing others to Jesus. And yet there are times, I'm sad to say, there are times when we as Christians, through our actions, through our sin, we do not point others to Jesus. We begin to point them away from the Lord. 
This is such a serious subject. This idea of causing someone to stumble, causing a little one, whether it's a child or someone young in the faith, someone to stumble. It's such a serious subject that Paul devotes an entire chapter in the book of Romans to this subject. Do you know what chapter it is? Romans 14. Paul devotes an entire chapter to this idea that we cause brothers and sisters in Christ to stumble. And Paul's premise is very simple. He says, don't, as Christians, stop quarreling about your opinions that have no eternal value. Don't, don't worry about it. Show grace to your brother or sister in Christ. Don't argue and quarrel over these things. Don't cause your brother or sister to stumble. And his conclusion is, how do we do it? How do I not cause my brother or sister to stumble? Paul says this, follow the example of Christ. If you do not want to cause someone to stumble, follow the example of Christ, who died for us. He didn't live to please himself. He didn't live to do what he would do, but he lived for the Lord, building his brother, his sister up. We're to be like Jesus Christ. Read Romans 14 this week. It's absolutely amazing. And yet here's the thing. All of us say, well, I don't cause my brother or sister to stumble. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't do that. Because here's, uh, here's what it is. It's easy for us to look with our little eyes and say, Lord, the woman you gave me, she causes so many people to stumble. Like all those things that she does. It's easy to see the sin in somebody else, especially those that are close to you that you get to see more than a couple hours a day. It's easy to see their sin. It's easy to see when somebody else, oh, that person caused that person to stumble. I saw what you did. You caused me. You better go out there. And yet many times, what do we do with ourselves? I wouldn't do that. We babysit, we babysat a little girl. She was like four years old, three or four years old. She was just at that stage where she's getting out of diapers. She's learning to get out of diapers. And so there was times she would have accidents and poop her diaper. And so to tell you that she pooped her diaper, you know what she does? She came up to us and she, she would say, I don't smell anything. Mm -hmm. Everybody can smell what's going on. We all can smell it. I don't smell anything. I don't see anything wrong with myself. I don't smell anything about myself, but you, I smell a poopy diaper. Look at that. Look at what you're doing. It's easy for us to see the sins of others. And so Jesus is sitting here saying, watch out. What does he say? How does he say this? Verse 3, he says, pay attention to yourselves. Exclamation point. You're so worried about the Pharisees. You're so worried about the other disciples. Pay attention to yourselves. Exclamation point. This is serious business. It was easy for the disciples to look at the Pharisees and say, oh yeah, those Pharisees are sinning. It was so easy for them to look at the Sadducees and say, those guys, don't, they don't follow the Lord. It's so easy for us to look at others and say, man, that person is in sin. They need to repent, man. And yet... Yet, how many of us are without sin? There's not a one of us in this room that's without sin. All of us sin. I sin. You sin too. It's common amongst us. And here's the, the next thing. You don't want to hear this, but it's true. You have caused someone to stumble. Your sin that you thought just affected you has caused somebody to stumble. You don't want to think about it, but it has. It's because it's easy. It's easy for us to see it in others. And yet Jesus is saying, stop. Stop looking at it in others. What's going on in your heart? What's going on in your life? Jesus is just reminding the disciples of something that he's already taught. What has he already taught? You guys know from Matthew chapter 7, verses 3 through, 3 through 5. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye? Why are you so focused on the sin in your brother's eye? But do not notice the log that is in your own eye. Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye? When there's the log in your own eye, you hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Easy to see the speck. That tiny little sin that's in our brother or sister, that tiny little sin that's in one of your family members, that tiny little sin that's in one of your coworkers, it's so easy to see, and then it starts grating on you, and you're like, oh man, this is just terrible. And yet it's so tough to see the sin that's in our own lives. We are absolute hypocrites when we focus so much on the sin in others and ignore the sin in ourselves. We have to deal with the issues that is going on in ourselves. And how do we deal with it? Well, Jesus says, examine yourself. Look, is there a plank in your eye? Look, 
Is there a plank in your eye? Is there a speck in your eye? Examine yourself. And that self-examination really cannot be done by us. Why? Because it's hard to see. It's very hard to see the sin in ourselves. We give ourselves a pass so many times. When we see the sin, we're like, ah, you know what? God's going to overlook that sin. It's okay. It's not affecting anybody. We make all kinds of excuses for our sin. And so that examination must be done by the Lord. I mean, it's, again, this is nothing new. This is one of my favorite verses in the Bible. This is what David says to God in Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24. Search me. Who? Search me, David. David doesn't say, let me search myself and see and know my heart and, and see and know my thoughts and see if there be any previous way in me. Let, me. let me examine myself. No, David says, God, search me, God. Know my heart. Try me. Know my thoughts. See if there be any previous way in me. And then when you see it, Lead me in the way everlasting. Reveal it to me so that you can lead me, so I can confess and repent, and you can lead, you can forgive and lead. Because when you confess and repent, God forgives and he begins to lead. Have you confessed and repented? Have you allowed the Lord to search? Have you confessed and repented? Has the Lord forgiven you and, and, and leading you? And as, we're, as we repent, as we're walking in the strength and power of the Holy Spirit, our relationship with the Lord will begin to grow. Our relationship with the Lord will begin to grow and we'll be able to encourage our brothers and sisters in Christ. Because that's the only way we can encourage anyone is when our own relationship with the Lord is in the correct place. And what does God say about that? What does Jesus say about that? He says, as your relationship is correct, as you've paid attention, as you've examined, as you've allowed the Lord to examine, as you've confessed and repent, if your brother sins, rebuke him. If he repents, forgive him. If he sins against you seven times in the day and turns to you seven times saying, I repent, you must forgive him. When you are in a right relationship with the Lord, yes, when your brother or sister sins, you go up in humility and love and say, hey, bro, are you okay? Is there something you need to talk about? I just saw what happened over there. Is everything okay? Because that wasn't, that wasn't, normal for you. I know who you are. You're a believer. That wasn't something that a believer does. Are you okay? Let go in humility and love with the idea that, that man, we want to see that person repent and be forgiven. We're to point that sin out. But we're to do it in a, in a humble way. You all know the difference between somebody pointing out sin in a humble way and someone pointing out sin in a prideful way. You've, all, you've probably experienced both. And what happens when somebody comes to you and points out your sin in a prideful way? <coughs> what do you do? If you're anything like me, you dig in your heels. Sometimes when my wife comes to me in, and, in a prideful way and starts pointing out my sin, oh, I dig in my heels. I'm not sinning. I am totally justified in my behavior. And then I have to repent later. Because <laughs> she knows. But when my wife comes to me and says, Eli, how's your relationship with the Lord? What's going on? That's not normal. And there's love and humility in pointing out an area where I've messed up. I'm so much more likely to repent and confess to the Lord and to my wife and move forward and there's forgiveness. I mean, and then especially if, if we see somebody causing a brother or sister in Christ to stumble, we're to say, wait a minute, let's not cause a brother or sister in Christ to stumble. Wait, hold on. What's going on? This isn't like you. Do you know this happened in the Bible? And do you know who it happened with? It happened with apostles. This very situation I'm describing to you happened with apostles. Do you know what apostles did this? Do you know what apostles caused somebody to stumble? Peter, who Jesus is talking to right here. I think that this little portion of scripture was for Peter because Jesus is saying, Peter, in the future, this is going to happen and you got to watch out. You gotta keep short accounts, you gotta repent. When did it happen? Galatians chapter two, verses 11 through 14, Paul writes, but when Cephas Peter came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face. There was a little brouhaha that occurred because he stood condemned, why? For before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. But when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. 
And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him so that even Barnabas, the son of encouragement, was led astray by their hypocrisy. Here, Peter, he's been eating and fellowshipping with the Gentile brothers and sisters in Christ. And all of a sudden, these guys from James come and they're the circumcision party. They got to do everything right according to the law of Moses. And so Peter's like, I'm not going to go eat with those guys anymore. And even Barnabas gets led astray. What does Paul do? But when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas, I said to Peter before them all, if you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile, not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? What's going on? You're being a hypocrite, Peter. Peter, you're being a hypocrite. This was an apostle. This is two apostles. Nobody is immune to this. We all sin. And many times our sin causes a brother to stumble or a sister to stumble. We, Jesus says, watch out. Whoa. If you get in that situation, there has to be repentance. The only way that Paul could bring this up with, with Peter is when Paul had a right relationship with the Lord. And the whole goal that Paul had in pointing out this hypocrisy was for repentance, for Peter to repent. And that's what Peter does. And what are we to do when somebody repents? Jesus tells us. What do you do when somebody repents? Forgive. And then they do it again. And what do you do when they... You gotta, if they repent, 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 forgive, 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 forgive. We're to forgive. The religious leaders of the day taught that all you had to do was forgive somebody three times. That's it. And after that, no more forgiveness. The forgiveness is done. The forgiveness jar is empty. <laughs> Jesus says, wait a minute, because again, it was Peter that said, well, should I forgive seven times? Because what did Peter do? Peter took the number three, doubled it, and added one because he was spiritual. He said, I'll forgive seven times, Jesus. And Jesus says, wait a minute. It's not just seven times you forgive. You forgive a limited amount of times. It's not your job to judge the sincerity of somebody's repentance. It's your job to forgive. That's between them and the Lord. You forgive when they come up to you and they repent. For anybody who's ever forgiven, not easy. It's not easy to forgive. Why? Why isn't it easy to forgive somebody. Because it's very simple, the debt that they owed you, the hurt that they caused you, is not going to be repaid. Somebody has to take on that debt. Somebody has to take on that hurt. That hurt needs to be put under the blood of Jesus Christ. And that's not an easy thing to do. You're not getting repaid. It needs to be put under the blood of Jesus. And that is so difficult. And so here, what do we have? We have, we have a world full of sin, a world full of temptation, a world full of stumbling, a world full of forgiveness and repentance. And what do the disciples see as their greatest need in a world like that? What is your greatest need in a world like that? The disciples tell Jesus what their greatest need is in verse 5. The apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. Jesus, what are they saying? Jesus we need more faith if we're going to navigate through all of these things in life. Increase our faith. Help us to grow. This is the only answer. Increase our faith. We need faith. In order to navigate through the temptations that come upon every one of us, we need faith. In order to, to, not, to live in such a way so that we do not stumble a brother or sister in Christ, we need more faith. In order to allow the Lord to examine us, revealing any wicked way in us, confessing and repenting, we need faith. In order for us to encourage our brothers and sisters in Christ, we need faith. We need faith for all of those things. Our faith must increase. We must believe God. We must be men and women of the word, walking it out in obedience, what God reveals to us, being filled with the Spirit. This is what we need. And it's absolutely true. Notice Jesus' response to their request. They say, Jesus, increase our faith. What does Jesus say? And the Lord said, if you had faith like a grain of mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. Jesus tells them, even a little faith, just a little bit of faith, if you exercise and use it properly, it will produce exceedingly abundantly above all that you can ask or think, because it's God that is working, not you. In essence, Jesus is telling his disciples here, yes, Pray for your faith to grow. Pray for an increase in your faith. But do not leave it at that. Do not just say, I'm going to pray for more faith and then just go about and do whatever you're going to No! Go out and exercise the little faith that you have. 
Don't just pray for an increase in faith. Go out and exercise the little faith that you have. And then as you exercise your faith, your faith will begin to grow. Because faith grows with exercise. And yet there's times, if you're like me, this year has been challenging. I am not a person that likes exercise. The reason I have dogs is so that I have to walk three miles a day. Because <laughs> otherwise I would get no exercise. I used to do push-ups and sit-ups and pull-ups and all these things. I just have no time. I hate exercise. And if left to myself, I will, re I I will just find something to do so I don't have to exercise. And maybe you're like me, that you fill up things in your life so that you don't have to exercise. God is saying, go exercise your faith. And you're saying, well, I don't really want to exercise my faith today. I prefer just to do what I want to do. I'd like to just examine and ponder these issues that are going on and, and throw myself a pizza pity party and just eat some pizza instead of exercise. Because my perspective on the, the events and the storms of life that I'm going through is that these things are absolute hindrances to me. And yet Jesus is sitting here with The events that you're going through are not hindrances. The events that you're going through are opportunities. Opportunities for growth. Think of your life. Just think on it for a moment. Do you view the challenge that you're in as a hindrance, or do you view the challenge that you're in as an opportunity? Many of us, we view the challenges that we're in as hindrances. I met a gentleman that's going through an extreme challenge in life. And he told me, Eli, this challenge isn't a hindrance, this challenge is an opportunity for me to be a man of prayer. The Lord is increasing my faith by growing me into a man of prayer in this challenge. The challenge was, became an opportunity for him, and that challenge that he's going through is probably the most difficult challenge that I've ever seen anyone go through. And so, for us, how do we view it? The challenges for us must be, we must begin to view them through God's eyes and view the challenges as opportunities instead of hindrances. We see this so many times in the, in the life of the heroes of faith in the Bible. Go look at the heroes of faith. The Lord calls them to do something. What do they do? It's an opportunity for them to exercise faith, and they step out in faith, and they begin to do it. And as they exercise their faith, as they step out in faith, do they make mistakes? Absolutely. They make mistakes. And yet they grow. And then the next call comes. And what do they do? They step out of faith, and then they grow. And then the next call comes, and they step out in faith, and what happens? Then they grow. You look at Abraham. How did Abraham's faith begin? When did it begin? What did God call Abraham to do first? What? What? Leave. Leave. Ur of the Chaldeans. Leave and go to the country that I'm going to show you. That was the call. And Abraham went. What was the last call for Abraham? Sacrifice your son. Do you see the steps of faith that had to happen? What if God couldn't have just gone at the very first, the first step of faith that says, go sacrifice your son? What if Abraham said at the very first thing, if that was the first call for Abraham, Abraham would have said, you are crazy. I don't know who you are, but you are insane. I'm not going to sacrifice my son. But because of his journey of faith, did Abraham make mistakes along the way? Absolutely. He sinned along the way. His sin probably caused others to stumble along the way. And yet, he kept, kept moving forward. And so we see this in the heroes of faith. And so, I mean, what was true back then is still true today. As we end this year, take stock. What has God brought you through? We asked it last week, how have you seen the faithfulness of the Lord? Have you seen the faithfulness of God in 2022? And then ask that question, what is God calling you to focus on in 2023? How is God desiring to grow your faith in 2023? What are the challenges that are before you? And are you looking at those challenges as hindrances or opportunities for the Lord to show himself mighty? And then we have to remember the final lesson of Jesus that he gives the disciples here. In order for your faith to grow, in order for your faith to grow through the difficult and even the impossible, you must remain faithful in the everyday, the little things every day. What example does Jesus give to illustrate this? Verse 7, will any of you who has a servant plowing or keeping sheep say to him when he has come in from the field, come at once and recline at table? Jesus asks a rhetorical question, a question with an obvious answer intended to illustrate a point. No one who has a servant will then wait on that servant. That's his servant. He's in, the idea here is nobody's going to do that. What will the master do? 
the master will do this, verse 8. Will he not rather say to him, prepare supper for me and dress properly and serve me while I eat and drink and afterward you will eat and drink? Does he thank the servant because he did what was commanded? This is what the, the servant will obey his master. This is the whole point. A servant obeys his master. What, in the big things? Out in the field? In the big things? But also in the little things, the day-to-day -day tasks of, of serving the, the food. No, uh, we might want to go out there and, and get a bumper crop and a great harvest, but none of us wants to serve the food. I don't want to do that. Somebody else do that. No, the servant is expected to be faithful whatever the master asks of him. And I love what Wearsby says about this. It is good to have faith to do the difficult. It is good to have faith to do the impossible. This is good. But it is essential that we have faith to do even the routine tasks our master has committed to us. Privileges must always be balanced with responsibilities. The privilege of serving God in those big things has to be balanced with the responsibility of living for God in day-to-day -day mundane life. When we're at home, when we're at work, when we're with our coworkers or school, so many times we want to do that big thing for God. I want to do that. That was me. I want to go to China, smuggle in Bibles. That's what I want. Visit the underground church. That's what I want to do. Do the laundry. I don't want to do the laundry. <laughs> Who wants to do the laundry? Nobody wants to do the laundry. We want to do those big things, and yet many times when we do those big things, we get a big head. Look at what I did. I went to China. I smuggled in all those Bibles. I've never been to China. I've never smuggled in Bibles. But we start to think, we get a big head, we start to think we're better than others. We start to think that people should serve us, and we forget that we too are servants, servants of God. Jesus is telling these disciples, he's telling us, as you see me doing exceedingly abundantly above all that you can ask or think, do not get a big head. Do not begin to think of yourself more than you actually are. Remain faithful. Remember what you are is what Jesus says. And what were they? What are we? The very last verse tells us what we are. Verse 10. So you also, when you have done all that you were commanded, say, we are unworthy servants. We've only done what was our duty. And if you look at that unworthy servants, maybe you have a letter or a number next to it. If you have, if you have one of the Bibles that has all the notes in it. And the, another translation of that unworthy servant, if you look, if you have a number and you look at the bottom, it says, or bond servant. An unworthy servant is a bondservant. Remember what you are. You are a bondservant of Jesus Christ. What is a bondservant? What is a bondservant of Jesus Christ? A bondservant of Jesus Christ is someone that says, I love my master and I choose to serve him willingly. This is a believer. We love our master. We love Jesus. And we say we are making a choice to serve him willingly with our lives. The principle of bondservant is found in Exodus chapter 21, verse 5 and 6. But if the slave plainly says, I love my master... My wife, my children, I will not go out free. Then his master shall bring him to God, and he shall bring him to the door where the door pours. His master shall bore his ear through with an awl, and he shall be his slave forever. There's a choice that we make. We say, I love the Lord. I'm going to serve the Lord forever. Whatever the Lord requires of me, that's what I'm going to do. As bondservants, it becomes our duty to obey God in everything, not just in the big thing, but in the little day-to-day -day things that we don't want to do. That's our responsibility, to serve God in everything. If you're reading through Colossians, you, <laughs> it's Lorena's favorite book, where it talks about we serve the Lord Jesus Christ. We, we're to serve him in everything that we do. This is the example that Jesus set for us. Psalm 40, verse 8, it says this about Jesus. I delight to do your will, O my God. Your law is within my heart. What was the will of God for Jesus? That Jesus delighted to do the cross. That's what Jesus delighted to do. He, delight, he said, I delight to do your will, O God. I delight to go to the cross so that the world can be reconciled. I delight to give up myself so that the world can be reconciled. So we can be forgiven and have a restored relationship with God. That God died for our sins. And if you don't believe in God, the answer is simple. We're all sinners. There's the only hope that we have is Jesus Christ, who died on the cross and gave himself for us. Repent. Do business with God. Lord, forgive me, I'm a sinful man. And yet for those of us who believe, for us tonight, the Lord has a desire for us. A desire that was for his disciples to grow our faith. To do that, he's going to reveal to you areas in your life that he's working on. And you have to allow him to. 
So often, we, we don't even want to allow him to reveal those areas. Don't tell me those areas, Lord. But he's revealing areas to you that he's trying to change. And asking you, are you going to exercise the little faith that you have in this area I'm revealing to you? Are you going to exercise your little faith? Are you going to battle the temptations that come your way? Are you going to live a life in such a way so that you do not cause others to stumble? Are you going to be one who forgives your brother or sister from the heart? Not just with lip service. Are you going to be one that encourages your brothers and sisters in Christ? Are you stirring them up towards love and good works? Are you a believer that remembers what you are? A bond servant. Each one of us, a bond servant of Jesus Christ. And so as tonight, this is my prayer for us as a church. We're entering into this Advent, this Christmas season, and the reason that Jesus came, Emmanuel, God with us, he came so that we could find life. He came not to live for himself, but he came so that he could die, take our place on the cross. He had so many challenges in his life, and yet he looked at the challenges not as hindrances, but opportunities. And so for us tonight, it's very simple. Are you going through a challenge? How are you viewing it? Are you viewing that challenge as a hindrance? I want to encourage you, and I hope the word of the Lord encourages you as well. Do not look at that challenge as a hindrance. View that challenge as an opportunity. An opportunity for what? An opportunity for you to serve your master. An opportunity for you to serve the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. An opportunity for you to serve Jesus Christ. An opportunity for you to grow in your relationship with God an opportunity for you to be what God has called you to be, an ambassador. God pleading through you so that others can be reconciled to him. Father God, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you for the things that, that you showed your disciples, Lord. They, were, they may have been sitting there cheering on the sidelines as you rebuked the Pharisees, and yet, Lord, you pointed right back at them and you said, be careful, disciple, be careful, believers. Don't cause your brothers to sin. Repent, confess. Move forward, press on. Be one that's an encouragement that, that walks in humility and love for God and others. Be one that whose faith is increasing and exercising the faith that they have. Remembering what we are, bond servants, that we love you, Lord. Lord, we pray that you would do a work in us. That as your bond servants, God, that you would work in us and through us so that a world would know that you are God. And so, Lord, we commit tonight to you. We commit this week to you. Lord, would you do exceedingly abundantly of all that we can ask or think? Because we're excited to see how you move in us and through us. So go before us. We commit ourselves to you in Jesus' name. Amen.